Okay, uh, first of all, let me just tell you you're in the right session. Uh, this is the session about the, the, the wild and woolly area of application security training for developers. So the, this is an interesting, I guess, I guess for how many, two hours, three hours, 45 minutes? Uh, this is a, the whole premise behind this, and I'll t t talk about it in a second, was uh, this whole world of application security training and whether or not it has an impact. So we'll get into this before we get going. Uh, that's me. I've been an application security person for about 10 years. I think I've been to every OWASP, AppSec, USA, and several of the EU ones. I enjoy coming over here. Um, security professional ISSA guy as well. Um, I'm also one of the three principals or owners, along with Dan Cornell of Denim Group. We're uh, about a 100-person security firm in uh, lovely San Antonio, Texas. I'm also a dad, and I'll just uh, point out my, my wife is particularly excited that I'm over here for a week, uh, not with her. She pointed that out on the way out. So, uh, and by the way, promptly went to the beach for a week and said, the hell with you, I'm going to the beach with the family. So that was a response for me going to the UK without her, for the record. So lesson learned for the newly married guy. Uh, so I'm, I'm one of those guys that thinks about AppSec a lot, believe it or not, like well, probably most of us. I mean, obsess about certain things uh, around, I mean, right now it's open SAM and about training and about, we get really tough client questions. We're a professional services firm. We get a lot of tough client questions. And the ones that stick with us are the ones we can't answer. Or we know we answered and said, wow, I wish I could answer that one better. Or I don't have any data or, you know, here's what I think or feel or here's what I perceive, but really not great answers. So I think about this stuff a lot and probably about two, literally a weekend and a half ago, week and a half ago I was in South Texas and working on some writing about Open Sam. True story, some thoughts around Open Sam. And I was at my mother-in-law's ranch in South Texas. So um, she asked me, I'm working, writing, and she said, hey, I need your help. And I said, okay, sure, you're my mother-in-law. I have to obey whatever command you, you send my way. She said, we, you know, we have this big drought, so I'd like you to go out with the ranch hands and go uh, rattlesnake hunting. And uh, kind of a surreal moment, because one moment I'm worried about like cross-site scripting errors and SQL injections and open SAM, and the next thing I'm looking for rattlesnakes. True story. And I went out, I said, okay, I gotta get a picture of this. So, you know, when I'm not thinking about AppSec, I think about this stuff. So, literally, we go and gather a couple of ranch hands uh, slash guest workers, and, uh, and, and went around and said, let's go do this. And, and for the record, how do you do snake hunting? Does anybody know how to do that? Probably not here, I imagine. You read about it or watch about it, right? So what you do is you either, if you're really an idiot, you go out and get guns and do it. We're, we're right below that, just partial idiots. Uh, so what we ended up doing is we said, let's, let's, let's get ready. And literally, Saturday morning. So what do you need if you're going to do a snake hunt? I mean. Literally, I forgot about this. I'm wearing an OWASP EU 2011 t-shirt. I had that down at the ranch. I was like, wow, uh, that's where it went. I had the t-shirt. You had to have cool hats, obviously. Uh, uh, to, to, always important in that part of the country. Snake guards. You can't get those here in a, in a shop, but you get those in South Texas. They're very functional. For the record, uh, snakes bite right above the, uh, the cowboy boot, right in the back of the calf. So those actually help. They kind of look a little weird. If they were black, they would have an S&M feel to them. But, uh, they're camouflage. Um, you know, obviously common gardening tools, uh, very important, uh, you know, because you can kind of hit the snake. And uh, a machete, now we're getting serious, but what you really need is you need a guy that actually has done this a bunch of times. So uh, that guy is a, definitely a snake killer and has been very successful. And why do we do this down there? Literally a week before, that was our swimming pool. Somebody heard a little kind of sound like a zipper sound. Open up the catchment for the swimming pool, there's a baby rattlesnake floating around in there. So uh, after we got that done, went back to AppSec stuff and uh, back to Open Sam. So just thought that, uh, it's kind of a weird, surreal Texas uh, AppSec story for you. Uh, I mentioned Denim Group, based in uh, about 100 folks, based in Texas, we do work all over, mostly North America, some work over here. Uh, much of what I'm gonna talk about today is colored by the experiences we had with training. You know, we're a vendor and we get asked questions about training, classroom training, e-learning, like, you know, what's the effect? How, how important is it? You know, if I buy this from you, what, you know, if I buy X amount of this, will I improve by 50%? And our response, or my response to all these questions involves some type of tap dancing routine, or kind of like, well, look over here, you know, or uh, uh, there, there really isn't a great answer, and that's the, the net of it. And at the same time, what really spurred me to start this particular effort 
was at the same time, Bruce Schneier and then a guy named Ira Winkler got in this nice little blog back and forth about the effect of, of security training or security awareness training. A little different, but the concept still held true, which was, you know, Bruce's uh, argument was, hey, this is an utter waste of societal resources. You know, you, you're spending money on awareness training. It's fill in the block. It is not making the users any smarter or any better or anything like that. And then Ira came back and said, oh, in fact, they are smarter, back and forth. Again, user awareness training. But I kept thinking, <laughs> I think that's a problem. Uh, how about training developers how to uh, develop code in a different way, in a more secure way? And I started thinking about it, and I started to characterize this, and it took us down this road. And I'll talk about the survey that we conducted, but it start, we started, I started to characterize this, characterize this issue, and I realized a handful of things. First of all, it's a bigger deal for software developers, because you know, how many people have done the ubiquitous corporate security awareness training? It, it, you know, it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe a link that you have to go past, or it, it, it is, is small, bite-sized training chunks. That is not the case uh, for secure development training, for most that know. I mean, most, most of the vendors, including ourselves, have a two-day intro to Java security program. That's two days, right? That's two days that you pull a bunch of people off the line. Or if it's the e-learning class, it happens to be the longest e-learning class in that library. It's not a 15-minute activity. So it's a bigger ask. It's a bigger ask of the dev folks, but a bigger ask of the business units, because the business units are the ones that are waiting for that, that uh, the stuff. So it's much more disruptive. Um, and again, as we all know, we've heard this probably ad infinitum, uh, they have the ability to say no. They, we call it the one finger salute. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have features and functionality that, we're, that we've promised the business unit. It is the ultimate trump card. So, so first of all, it's not the equivalent at any rate of user awareness training because it's a bigger deal and it takes more effort and more resources. And if you have 2,000 developers, imagine the disruption across the team. So that's one, one issue. But at the same time, we see organizations doing this over and over and over again. Why? Because guess what? We have folks like the payment council and, you know, industry, the, pay, uh, the payment card industry, excuse me, and uh, mandating it. It's in there. 6.5.a, I think it is, says thou shalt train uh, developers. That, by the way, for the record, dr drives most bought development. Most development that vendors deliver is driven off of that. I think 90, 85 to 90 percent for the record. Uh, and, and why do we know that? We ask that question. Why are you buying this? And they say, oh, because PCI makes me do that. Not because they have to or it's the right thing to do, but because PCI. So it's a little sad story there, but it's true. But that's in there. There's no effort in PCI to say thou shall go back and, and va validate or verify that there was an impact, that code actually got better, right? None of that. Kind of like the WAFs issue. You have to have a WAF. It doesn't have to be effective. Um, but what I found out as I started to do uh, literature review, and I actually had a graduate student, a uh, computer science graduate student, assist me for about six months in this project. So let's go do an exhaustive lit review. And what I found out, number one, is there was very little literature. I mean, Bruce Schneier blog post is literature, I guess, but no scientific, no real academic research in this. And I found out there was very little research, period, in uh, uh, what I'd consider uh, citable or academically uh, cited on HR training. N name, pick one topic. You know, uh, a compliance around, uh, you know, equal opportunity stuff in the States. You know, I have to treat people really nice. Every company has to do it. Uh, they check that block, that little box, but there are very few that have gone back to say, okay, let's see how, uh, how well people have remembered this stuff absent of a lawsuit. In a lawsuit, they get those questions in a, in a, in a legal setting. But for the most part, it doesn't get measured. So, and, and then I found out, you know, workforce analytics in general, there's, you know, so the whole training industry, not just security or AppSec training, the whole training industry, uh, this is a real big criticism of not CIOs, but CEOs and CFOs. That like, hey, that's great, uh, uh, you know, training, it's a feel-good thing, uh, very little impact. So that's the starting point for this, uh, this, this analysis. Very little literature, very little precedence. And in a, if I look a, a, across the broader workforce and kind of HR world, uh, there's very little there too. So very little cited. Um, so on top of it, as we all know, the, the turnover so for software developers is horrific. So in the States, there's actually a, a group called the Bureau for Labor Statistics. They capture these things. But typical turnover uh, is roughly around 14 to 15% annual, per annum. For, for any company. It's worse within IT, it's five points more, but software development is typically uh, 20 to 30. 
if you go to the frothier parts of software development, like Silicon Valley, it's closer to 30 to 40 percent. Some of that's anecdotal, but if you talk to most of the dev managers, it's about 30 percent in the places like Silicon Valley. My point here is, so not only do we not have much to cite, on top of it, if you trained your developers two years ago, it's not the same developers you have right now. Many of them have exited the organization, they've been promoted, they might have moved roles, many of them might have uh, you know, become, realized that they weren't great developers, they've moved on, but, but that number is typically 20 to 30 percent. Do that out over three years and you realize, wow, that is a, a total redo. And we see it as vendors, because we've, we've been in public meetings like this or in conferences where we have a CIO or CISO client get up and say, you know, we've done secure development training. And I'll look at Dan and say, I remember doing that brown bag in 2009 for those guys, for the, you know, for the guys that we all know are no longer there. So uh, in a management standpoint, they remember that and they'll say, oh, we did that. But the point here is, uh, obviously, you've got to do it in a recurring way. So that, that exacerbates the problem. So let me talk about the research I did. Uh, and this was a major effort that started really last spring and then ended about a week before AppSec USA last year when I had to present. I mean, it was furious gathering data. First of all, it made me appreciate a little bit more, or a little bit of, of Gartner, IDC, Forrester, all those analyst groups that do surveys. Surveying is hard, and get, gathering data is really hard. And I'll talk about how, what some of the things we found out about that process that can apply to people within companies. And there are a lot of different things. Excuse me for the, that, there we go. So the first effort here, let me just talk about the overview of the study itself. It was focused on software developers, not security people, not general users, but software developers. And when I said broadly software developers, I mean software developers, QA folks, and architects. We didn't break out, you know, BAs and all the different iterations and types of people, but we just said, here's three groups of people that we consider software developers. What we wanted to do was a handful of things, was to measure the awareness of the developers of key concepts in application security, and then whether or not training had an impact whether or not there was a before and after, which we found out was very, very hard to do. So we wanted 1,000 uh, software developers. We ended up getting around 600, very, okay, very U.S. And, and North American centric because that's where we're based. And as we found out, gathering these respondents was bloody difficult, you know, let alone you know, trying to do it uh, in Europe or other places. So there's a definite bias for North America. You can read into it what you want. Uh, but we wanted to get cross sections of different verticals. Uh, and, and including financial, government, and I will just tell you right off the bat, we had a, a fairly sam a high sampling of governments here for whatever reason. We had a bunch of state government folks that responded, and also some uh, very large energy companies. Being in Texas, overrepresented, that's where we're from, easier to gather. But we try to get a lot of companies also that were starting an AppSec training initiative. Those are the guys that really were incented to to, to you know, say, I want to know a before and after so I can report back to my boss. So a lot of those companies and organizations, it, there was a timing issue involved with this too because we wanted to capture. And about, of those 600, we got about 100 that we were able to get a before and after. And I'll explain again so how hard this was. So that was kind of the, an overview of the respondents' demographics. Uh, you know, uh, as far as company size, most of the people identified, self-identified as software developers. Again, there's no validation of that. You know, uh, titles mean different things to different organizations. If you notice in the right-hand slide, there's other. Uh, that, that, you know, we got the people wrote down BAs, and we had all, everybody. We had folks that were in audit, folks that got, like, went into classes or took these classes. So, so this is an imperfect, uh, you know, process. The other thing is, throughout this process, I had two political science professors that were coaching me, because this ultimately the... The survey part of this was a, a political science kind of a, 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 a statistical sample survey issue, less of a computer science and security issue. And they said, hey, this happens all the time. And so, as I'll talk about in a second, I'm doing a 2.0 version this summer, and we're going to try to refine so we get less others. That's one of the things that kind of surprised us. But the company size reflected uh, you know, who we were able to talk to. There's some big companies and medium-sized companies. Uh, slightly underrepresented in the financial area, and we'll talk about that too as well. Now, one of the interesting things is, is we had a lot of people that identified that they were in the software field for more than seven years. That jumped out at me, first of all. We had 600 folks. It, again, it was very difficult to get people to respond, get all these responses back, and I said, wow, that just strikes me as unusual. We look at our development team, we look at most of the guys that we work with in Silicon Valley, 
and they're all 25, you know, the millennials. Um, what we went back and looked at the respondents, again, we said, uh, had an oversampling of government and oil and gas, and guess where the 50-something programmers live? They live in public sector organizations and in oil and gas. How do I know that? Is I, uh, anecdotally, I did a lunch and learn for one of these large state agencies right before that, and I was the youngest person in the group at 48. Shocking. So, uh, and uh, I probably, well, I'll just leave it at that. So, so I knew that anecdotally, and one other thing I learned with this survey is, you know, we have more than one anecdote that becomes data, and you can't ignore anecdotes as you're doing this. So that's one of the a couple of things that the, these, these professors pointed out to me. So a bunch had, had no previous training, about 168, but the, you can see a lot of people did have some kind of training. Now, one thing we didn't capture that maybe I need to this, in this next go round is how long ago was that training? You know, we're about two months into it, and I was like, yeah, that would have been a good one to ask, and kind of hard to ask. So, so again, this is, and I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this several times, there's literally nothing else out there along this line. So, so this will get better at, over time. But, you know, we don't know how long ago. We don't know what that class was. Was it was a 15-minute intro? Was it a lunch and learn? Was it a two-day class that a, a great vendor taught? Who knows? Okay, so methodology-wise, and I'm going to get to the data here shortly, but this is an important uh, journey. 15 multiple choice questions. I wanted originally talked around and said, well, let's, let's use samples of, of code, and we can do a before and after, or we could have them identify vulnerabilities or fix things. What we realized is that was going to be exceptionally difficult. Uh, and, and number one, uh, the many different platforms that people code in, different languages, are, uh, all, you know, it was just too difficult to do that. So what we wanted to do, and then also the grading, there's shades of gray, and you know, did he do that kind of well? Did he answer that one kind of well? So what we ended up doing is we came up with 15 questions that we felt were representative of two different areas within application security. One was awareness. You know, what is a cross-site scripting error, number one? And number two, what, how do you fix a cross-site scripting error? More the defensive and more the prescriptive stuff. Very different. One is, again, general awareness. Do you know what it is? And the other is, like, when push comes to shove, how do I fix it? Uh, we target software developers, as I mentioned. We did it online. We, uh, we did two or three things. One is we had classroom training. We had several classroom training sessions. Uh, and actually, Dan was one of the guys that delivered them. Had a captive audience of 25 people. We did the old school, printed them out. And, uh, and the real sobering uh, fa fact that we learned is like not all of them filled the, 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 fir the first session of 25. We got like 12 back. And I was like, what the hell? You know, you were in there in the classroom with them for two days. And so right off the bat, we found out that, uh, you know, developers don't like to do training. No, well, they, 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 uh, we'll talk about that and how incentives matter. But that was a, a wake-up call early on. We also sent it out uh, to these organizations via SurveyMonkey. And then we also did a Twitter and Facebook uh, campaign for a while at the very end to get a, 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 a broader sample. So we had three hypotheses going in. You have to have, hi have, to have hypotheses as starting points. Uh, a couple of them bore out, a couple of them were very shocking. First of all, the number one that most software developers still don't have uh, key concepts of AppSec under their belt. They still don't fully understand that we hoped, and particularly as a vendor that does this, that there's some impact, some positive impact after training. You know, we hope that there's not a negative correlation. That would be bad uh, or nothing. So we hope there's some positive one. And then the last one, given our, our work with financial services industries and banks, that they're, you know, those guys have a, a, much, a much further starting point. They're better, they're much more regulated, they get it. Uh, that one did not bear out in this particular survey, and, uh, but we'll talk about why, why we think that is the case. So here's examples of the sample questions. As I mentioned, uh, these are the awareness types. Are you aware? These are basic 101 stuff that, that I'm honestly, most of our sales force at Denim Group could probably get right. Um, if you've been through awareness. And here's an example of, of the prescriptive uh, ones that came out. And uh, again, how do you help protect against these things? Uh, we actually, so we're going to mix these up this next go around. Uh, and it was very interesting. There was a couple that people bombed, a couple of awareness ones that people bombed. So that may, if you, so one thing you start to realize, maybe that's a bad question. Next go around, we'll throw that one out and use one. Um, but in general, um, we learned some things. So let's talk about the key survey results. So this is what everybody's interested in. So right off the bat, we saw a couple things. And number one, um, that architects, as you might imagine, had a much higher awareness of these of concepts and prescriptive stuff. 
as did developers, but QA overall did poorly. This is an important one. Uh, this is a broad slide, but if you dig deeper into the data and if you start to uh, throw a couple things out, it gets even worse. This is important because in more, a lot of organizations, the AppSec function lives in QA, right? And if you're relying on the QA group to do AppSec, and that's where you also park your most junior developers, how many people do that? How many people have an intro, I mean, the, the, the entry point for development is to go work in QA for the first couple years to understand automated testing. That's a lot of organizations. So they're not gonna, they're not, they're, they're learning how to build software functionality or to test it more accurately, they're probably not gonna be able to get the AppSec stuff. So that's, that's a key thing to look at. We're gonna tease that one out the second one. Um, so the second one, as I mentioned, they got the awareness ones we, uh, pretty well, but didn't, didn't know how to operationalize that across that. The, uh, the, the biggest one was the difference between the cross-site scripting error uh, differences. That was a big, big one, and that, that jumped out at us. Um, this was an interesting question. 100% could de define input validation, uh, but nearly 9% correctly defined proper session IDs, which is re reassuring. So we had some that were uh, counterintuitive in that regard. Um, okay, so here's the other big one. 25% was the number that we got out of this survey, before and after, before classes and after classes. We have the contact data for virtually 100 of those people that, that self-identified and were able to come in and say, yes, we'd like to, to retest. Uh, one of our things we're toying with is trying to see how many of those 1 to 100 we can go back and see a year later and see how, how much they remember. That, that might be more, that might be this whole presentation the next time. It's just what those guys did. Um, but I'll tell you, it was very difficult to get the, them, to, not, not everybody wanted to opt in and to identify. In order to, to get back in touch with them, we have to have some contact data, typically an email address. The vast majority of people didn't want to present that. So the, the 100 out of 600 self-identified and did that. But that's, so about a 25%, and that's usually, that was like class, you know, uh, know nothing, take class, take a quiz. So that's right after. So retention is probably not going to get better, it might go, it depends. They might have put these practices to work. They might, uh, who knows, they might be the same, but that's one thing we want to go back and test. Uh, this one I, I wonder about, it said enterprises of more than 10,000 personnel have the lowest secure coding knowledge. I think that goes back to that state agency, state public sector workers and oil and gas industry who are, oil and gas guys are, excuse me, if they're, in your, they're, they're, they're not financial services folks as far as security. So I think that might be skewed. That jumped out at us, but I don't know about that. The majority of the response had no prior secure coding train, but that might be surprising. Again, uh, I, I, I don't know what to read into that. What we really need to do is go back and correlate those answers, the, uh, the training to the people that, re, uh, that passed and didn't pass. We, didn't, we weren't able to do that. Okay, and there was no correlated uh, uh, correlation between the years of experience and knowledge of secure coding uh, for effective training. Again, that is one that I think get, gets washed out over all those numbers and uh, one that we're going to look at more closely. Um, okay, the response to have more than three days of AppSec training in the past were able to answer more than half the questions correctly, which is okay, except for we typically say 70% is a passing grade. Most, most organizations say that. Um, you know, that, that's okay. And then 100% correctly identify where cross-site scripting executes. Oh, that's not good. That wasn't me. I'm still sitting <laughs> You know, if I can go for 35 hours straight, your, the AV system should be able to go. Well, let me talk through this while we're doing it. Um, and I'm going to go through, what's that? <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> wow, wow. Uh, okay, so let me, I'm going to just go off uh, tether here. All right. All right. Uh, one thing we learned, it wasn't at all in this, in the questionnaire, and we are going to tease this out next time, is how radically different 
uh, developers learn from the way that companies teach. And what I mean by that is um, if you're a big company and you have to do an app set program, there's really two ways to do training. There's two or three. One is to do classroom training. You either do it yourself, do lunches, learns, get people together, or to do is distributed e-learning, CBT, do it in a, in, a, in a less disruptive way across time. You can also do, you know, webinars, there's all these different little kind of in-between ways. Uh, those are typically what we call very formalized training, and uh, they're easy to document. And if you're, for example, a QSA, you want to see, you want to see that course outline, you want to see who consumed it. So that's a formal and kind of static way of doing training. And one thing we learned is developers hate that type of training. Why do they hate that type of training? There's two reasons. Number one, it takes them off of their deadlines, obviously. But one thing we realize is that that training is supposed to be designed broadly for software developers. But as soon as you, you know, you go in a big enough company, they have uh, people that are doing PHP, they hit Ruby on Rails. Like if you make them take a .NET class, we've seen that before, that is, has the exact opposite effect and they just turn off. Uh, the other thing is, but more importantly, what we learned is that developers learn much more informally. The, the term that Gartner uses now is called social learning or social conceptual learning. So what they're doing is they're learning from peers, they're learning from each other, learning from obviously RSS feeds, they're learning in smaller bits and bytes, and, 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 but they're doing it more frequently. And if you look at the mobile languages, it's a great indicator of that. Uh, most software developers started out having formalized education, probably have a bachelor's of science in computer science, but after that, that's the last time they sat in major classroom environments, right? I mean, for the most part, unless you got, went off and got a PhD or master's. Nobody went off and took four weeks off to go to Android camp. Or to, learn, or to learn iOS, they did it on the fly, right? They did it on the fly. So that's contextualized learning, that's you know, social learning. They did it in smaller, but they, they learned it. You know, these modern, uh, the, more, the, the frameworks that are out there, we went off and went to uh, Ruby on Rails, formalized classroom training, There's very little of that that happens. So that's the thing, how do you then tailor, if you're building a program, how do you, you do that? You have to use these, these platforms and these programs that your auditors want or your, your management wants because they spent money on it, they don't want you to, to do social learning, to conceptual learning because you can't measure, it's very amorphous. But at the same time, that's how your developers learn. So you got to take bits and uh, parts of each of that. Um, the other thing that I would say is incentives absolutely matter. Uh, at, what I mean by that is, I, I told the story about the classroom training where we were sober, sobering, in a sobering way, found out that nobody finished the uh, forms. We had, out of that 600, about 150 that were not completely filled out. I call it, you know, survey fatigue, whatever you want to call it, but we also, so a lot of people didn't finish it. Um, towards the end of the uh, survey, we ended up throwing out Amazon gift cards. And remarkably enough, every single one from that point on was filled out com and complete, completely. So uh, if you're rolling out a program internally and you think people are going to, you know, do this stuff because it's the right thing to do or they want to do it, uh, that's, that's probably naive. Uh, spend some money, get some gift cards, and suddenly they pay attention. And if you think that you're above that, then don't go outside and take any of the little vendor tchotchkes. Because uh, I've seen like the, many of the mighty security guys go and trick or treat like everybody else and grab the little thing. So the reality of it is we're human beings. We have kids. Some, some of us do. And, you know, but so incentives matter, right? Um, and that was a sobering uh, thing that, 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 that we noticed. Um, I talked about this a bit. Um, again, the rise of social learning systems, that's kind of a buzzword term, but that is one that's out there that, uh, and there's, you know, the learning, you know, the term learning management system is a very, is very much an e-learning thing, but they're becoming, they're all having social uh, network components to them. So if somebody sees a cool article, they can share it across uh, the dev teams and all that. Some of that obviously is done through existing platforms, but uh, corporations are trying to formalize that so that they can measure it a little bit more. Again, on one end, they, um, they've, they've got to be able to tell their auditors or shareholders, yeah, we're doing training. On the other end, uh, you know, they don't want they, they, they to make a drudgery either. Um, so here's the other thing. Uh, refresher training is, is obviously still needed. Don't, we, we're going to try to hit the follow-up uh, survey and uh, hit the 100. But obviously, that's like any other classroom thing. If you don't apply it, or if you're not familiar with it afterwards, uh, if you're one and done, you'll, you'll forget everything. Um, the most successful organizations we've seen, the people that pay attention in class, 
are the ones where it's built into their performance reports, the developers, you know, in some type of fashion. I think the famous one or infamous one was Microsoft uh, checking in bad code, vulnerable code. If you checked in vulnerable code three times in a row, you got fired. I don't know how true that was. Uh, but it, it does matter. We've seen organizations that have put that in performance plans. People pay attention. If you let them know that, that's in their performance plan before they before they do training, then it also becomes more important. Uh, we've seen a couple of innovative, uh, innovative companies where they just literally will take a little video snippet from their CFO that says, hey, this is, I know you're here for a day, this is important, here's why it's important, pay attention. You know, we protect, we, we take our customers' data real seriously. You saw what happened at Target, you saw what happened over here, you know, just a 15 minute snippet, or excuse me, 15 second snippet is better than nothing. And then the other thing that I would, I would encourage everybody here to do is be able to at least try to measure some type of numbers because managers, if you go to MBA school, I went to business school, if you, go, if, you're, if you talk to CFOs, they live in the world of numbers and they view the rest of the world as being lazy for not doing that. So uh, like, why do I get to live in the world of numbers and you just get to prance around and talk about security stuff? So if you have some kind of measurement or even an attempt at measurement saying, hey, this is what we're trying to do, that goes a long way because the rest of the world, business units, uh, projects for profitability, uh, they all are measured against that standard. Mention the incentives, uh, obviously Amazon cards or anything like that. Um, so again, key concepts here. Uh, unfortunately, software developers still don't know uh, the, the key concepts, un unfortunately. Uh, you know, they, they, they really didn't do well on the prescriptive stuff, most of them failed. Uh, the next time we do this, we're gonna try to differentiate the, the people that have taken classes from the people that haven't, do a better job of that. Um, you know, but it does increase about 25% is what we saw that, was, uh, that, that does speak to the, you know, some impact of training. We'll see how long-term it is. And I think, again, the big one that jumped out at us was the QA one. We did not anticipate that. It wasn't one of our hypotheses but they really did not do particularly well. And we're gonna really spend a lot of time trying to do that. The other one is business analysts, right? We didn't do PMs, but BAs are the ones that translate business unit requirements to software, at least in theory. Like if they're not baking in any requirement for security, then the developers are gonna ignore it too. So we may break out a category for BAs as well. So I guess this died again, so that's a good time to wrap up. And uh, wow. Uh, it's not my AV day. Uh, so with that, I'll open up for questions. Or, or no questions, either way. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, that is a, I mean, ultimately, the best way is to look at code, is to look at code before and after, are the results per line of, you know, vulnerabilities per line of code. The problem is gathering that data. Uh, if I learned anything out of this, is the gathering process for this is, is very difficult and manual. And um, you, that's, that might lend itself to doing the internal idea that we talked about to prove uh, to your manager. That's easier done on a much small, smaller scale but you can't do that and then do a survey because it's so different from teams to teams to teams. So that's where, if you're looking for a way to impress your manager, say, here's what we did, we did a before and after, that, that probably will carry more weight internally than externally. That's my two cents. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this again in July, and July is remarkably close to today. Uh, so get back next Tuesday. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in participating, I'd love to have, uh, I have folks over here do that. I mean, it's, what, what it is is like, I don't care about the clients. It's the anonymized data that I really want. And I'd love to, if there's other companies or other individuals or vendors, honestly, that want to play, I'd love to play. Because it, it was, it, it was, Utterly, it was a huge effort to get that 600 respondents. And like I said, 150 didn't e even finish, and we were worried about that. Yes, ma'am? No, data collection uh, responses. Uh, you can get the link out, and you can do all these different things. It's getting valid responses, or in the case of the 150, people finishing it. So we had 450 that were finished. 
Uh, and this is after going to multiple companies, going to partners, going to social media, Twitter, uh, and, uh, and, and we, we did as many avenues as a company can. Now, by comparison, to give you an idea, uh, we know of at least one other vendor in our space, and you know, everyone's space here, that went to go do, uh, get some benchmarking data around OpenSAM, and they paid IDC 60 grand to do a dumbed down version of what we did here. 60 grand for two months to go and do carpet bombing to get all this data. And so it's, it's, a, it's not a trivial effort to get the responses in. To, to craft it and the science behind that, I thought, was really the hard nut to crack. It wasn't. It was the, it was the collection part. So, yes, sir. We did not. That's a great. That's a great idea for the next time around. The sample between, I think, we probably had about sixty in e-learning. Excuse me, sixty in classroom training and about forty in, in e-learning. So I don't think the sample size was large enough. But that's a great point. Uh, my my suspicion, hopefully, is that the classroom training would have a larger impact than e-learning. Uh, but I think the sample size was too small. Again, but that's a great one. I'll I'll, I'll consider that going forward. I think that, the BAs, you know, pulling out the BAs to see if those guys, because out of that 150 that said other as far as uh, jobs, I think a good 60 were BAs, business analysts. Yes, sir. Oh, all of it. All of it? Uh, so uh, I, uh, let, me, let me address that one. Uh, First of all, I think there's actually more hope over here. The way that uh, that you promulgate security standards is a little bit more top down. In this instance, it actually works a lot better. In the states, it's every man for himself, every state for himself, every. And um, what we see is it's a very much state to state, university to university initiative. And if most of the largest universities have a secure development class, it's mostly one lecture is about defensive coding. The rest are about encryption, because that's what the professor understands. Uh, that's, that's the, that is the brutal reality. It might be different here. I understand it was a trusted software initiative. Uh, trustworthy software initiative in the UK is an effort to push some of those standards down. Uh, because you have a much more centralized higher education system, more, more standardized from the central government down, uh, you, may, you may have a better chance of pushing that than we do. Ours is all state government, and again, Texas is different from the other 49, and that's where the, 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 our system fails. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Well, that's what I thought on the other side of the Atlantic, at least. That's what I was telling. Well, it's, it's, it's you know, uh, then, then I, I probably, that was my, my perception, assumption. I will say in the States, it's, a, it's, it's terrible. Like if you're a tenured professor over there, unless you, do, I mean, you're, you're and, and these guys are comfortable teaching the same topics that they've taught forever. So you talk OWASP and defensive coding, and that I think Carnegie Mellon, I think Purdue, and two or three other class, uh, schools, which are, they have what we would consider a secure development class. The rest are some secure system class, and it's mostly encryption, and High orange book or whatever stuff that it's like it's science fiction like and not applicable. Yes, sir. Um, this is sort of aimed at teacher development and to coding and teacher training and using sort of quite recent stuff. Have you any plans to do something similar with text strategy teaching and the things outside the box and take it into effectively native sense of security rather than evolving the technical requirements? Uh, I was I was being ambitious with this, but not that ambitious. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, that is a age-old problem, and I think it's close to that QA issue that we talked about. If, QA, if it sits in QA and your, your most junior developers are, are testing for AppSec cases, then you're, then you're in a, a tough spot. And our experience is, is that if you are, you have to switch a, a bit and think differently, and, and most QA people don't. They still don't, and the, it's discouraging. I mean, we've been in this business since 2004-ish, and there's days that we just go, oh my God, we've had no effect. You know, we've been out there flying across the Atlantic, proselytizing, doing these things, and 
there's days. I mean, it's, it's just, the point is, is these QA people that are here in 2014 are different from the people that are in that same role in the same company 2011. They just cycle through. So if you're not doing that constant training or velocity of training, then you, you're, you're there. You're in the same position you were. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, it's the age-old issue. You know, absent of a, again, target-like breach, that's an example we have over, other, you know, where, where the CEO gets fired. It's, it's a, you know, $500 million hickey that hits the, the, the pocketbook of the shareholders. You know, how do you get people to do the right things absent of a near-death experience or a death experience in the case of a breach? And that's just a real hard thing to do because it's so easy. I mean, there's, there's QA magazines. There's a whole, like, a subgenre of QA. Believe it or not, I, I, I saw one the other day, a quality test magazine. Uh, they don't talk about this stuff. And I think Dan got selected to speak at Java One this year. There's a couple of security tracks there, but, I mean, most of what they, they discuss there is absent of, of this. It's like a different, different world. So it's changing a little bit. All right, well, uh, I'll be around if you have any questions. Thanks for bearing through the AV uh, problems. And uh, again, if you're interested in this, uh, grab me, because we're starting this again, and it was bloody difficult. I'll just add that. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.